Thank you. So this is my first time speaking at an event like this. Uh, so um, uh, my, my growth as a developer, my scope of knowledge has uh, greatly benefited from watching videos and slide decks from events like this. And I've desired an opportunity to, uh, to participate and give back. So this is the first time I've had that opportunity. So I'm very grateful to be up here in front of everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, JavaScript promises today. Uh, more specifically, focusing on how they help us as developers avoid callback hell. And uh, the, my talk is going to be a little bit higher level, not as uh, deep and technical, um, because the concepts can be applied to uh, use cases with Node.js and also from the front end. Um, so if you're a newer or a novice Node developer such as me, um, this will be another tool in your tool belt that you can uh, pull out and, and write cleaner, more maintainable, scalable code. <clears throat> so just short intro to who I am. Um, I'm a, uh, primarily a front-end developer at a company called Real Matters. Uh, I'm honored to have one of my coworkers with me here tonight. Um, I am currently working in a uh, startup group within Real Matters uh, using uh, a, using a stack called or a Yeoman generator called J Hipster. <laughs> so if you look that up, um, you will actually see an icon of a giant hipster. <laughs> uh, the stack is uh, Java Spring on the back and uh, Angular on the front. Using either you choose whether you want to use Gradle or Maven for your build uh, and for front end. Uh, dependency management, uh, we are using Node.js. We are using Node for uh, dependency injection, for compiling our SAS, for uh, minifying, for uh, uglifying, minifying images, basically anything you would do on, on the front end to make our lives better, make the front end lighter, meaner, easier to maintain. Um, my favorite thing about it as a front end developer and as a UI designer, uh, is the uh, real-time refresh and the real-time SAS compile. So when I make a tiny little change, whether I'm adding one pixel to a padding, as soon as I hit save, by the time I tap back to my browser, it's there. So uh, without Node, uh, that would not be possible, and my work would take a lot longer. So um, I'm an electronic musician. That's my hobby and my passion. Uh, I collect synthesizers. And uh, I'm a passionate developer. I love to go to things like this, meet people, learn, and grow. And I'm a devoted father of a three-year-old. Um, I already talked about my current project and stack. And so my, my node experience on the back end has mainly been through uh, side projects. And in one of my former careers working at McLaren McKen, um, I got to show some node, uh, some MVPs, some small uh, proof of concept presentations using some real time stuff using socket IO and using Node, and, uh, and that was great. So, why another presentation on promises? There's hundreds of them out there, lots of blog articles. Um, this, pr primarily, this is the intro to promises that I wish somebody would have given me before I had gone down the rabbit hole of researching them on my own and running into all those articles. Um, what I found the primary uh, issue with them was is they didn't give me enough uh, con conceptual background. They didn't talk about, uh, they would talk about promises from a really abstracted uh, point of view, but as soon as they wanted to give code presentations or, or sorry, code examples, uh, they would go and grab a library and uh, those popular libraries uh, have a very specific API and, and they're great, they're full of features and they make our lives easier. Um, but if that API were to suddenly disappear, I would have to relearn the concept of promises all over again. So, uh, and I understand why all those exist. Um, the promises were around before ES6 and before the promise uh, specification was finalized with ECMA, uh, but it is now. And we have libraries that follow the spec, so you only have to learn the API once, and you can use it the same way on the front end or the back end. And if you're not using ES6, and this presentation will not be in ES6, so uh, people who are uh, 
handcuffed to ES5 for various reasons will be able to uh, to use promises. And there's a polyfill that follows the spec, and it's really easy. And I'll sh in in uh, my code example, it, it uses the polyfill. Um, I did showcase one article. I will put this um, this presentation up on uh, somewhere, either a Dropbox or a GitHub, and uh, the Node.js meetup site hopefully can, can put the link. Uh, but this particular article, Robot Lolita, um, she explained promises uh, to the nth degree, and pro a lot better than I'm going to explain it tonight. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I encourage you to read that article. It is definitely worth a read, but uh, I don't get to talk for an hour and a half, so I can't uh, cover everything that was in there. Uh, so the main thing is I'm doing this presentation because now that we have a promise stack, uh, we can start writing promises in a lean, native way uh, without a library-specific uh, API to learn. So what are promises? So when the terminology comes up, uh, you never know if they're talking about the, con the concept or the library or, or what specifically are promises. So the truth is, they're everything. They're a programming concept, uh, they're a tool, they're a specification, and they're a library. So uh, as a programming concept, uh, promises, the main thing behind them is they represent the eventual result of an asynchronous operation. So uh, again, I'm going to steal this from the Robot Lolita article, but the best way to describe them from a pragmatic uh, point of view in a metaphor would be if you go to a busy restaurant and all the tables are filled, uh, but they take your name and they say, we're going to have a table for you. Well, you don't get to take the table you're going to have with you while you're waiting. So they give you one of those little coasters that vibrate and light up. Think of that as a promise. That is a representation of your eventual table that you're going to get to sit at. And that is exactly what promises are in, in the JavaScript world. Um, and as an ECMA specification, so there's been quite a few attempts to implement the promise uh, pattern. Uh, jQuery did it one way. Angular uh, used to do it another way. Um, Ember did it another way. And now we have a promise specification, and a lot of those libraries, latest version of jQuery, AngularJS has adopted the Q library, um, and the actual ES6 uh, promise library is actually a subset of RSVPJS, and that's what Ember uses for its promises. So uh, you're pretty safe now. You can pick up any library. Most of you can pick up the most popular ones, and they will uh, they will conform to the spec. And that's great, because if those libraries somehow become outdated, developers stop maintaining them, uh, you won't have to rewrite your syntax. You just have to adopt it with a new dependency. Uh, these implementations at the core give developers the use of a promise object uh, or a function with a then method whose behavior conforms to the promise specification. So what that basically means is when you are using promises, the first thing you create is a promise object. And that what makes that uh, promise object conform to the specification is the fact that it, once you have it, you have access to a then method. And therefore, we say that whatever you have attached a uh, promise object to is called thenable. So anything that's thenable hopefully confirms to the promise spec. Why do we need promises in JavaScript, and why should I care about them? So let's take a step back at a core JavaScript function, just a function declaration. At their core, JavaScript functions execute logic, return values, or throw exceptions. They are not uh, asynchronous in nature. They are a synchronous entity that we use. But it's 2015. And we work in an asynchronous world, a real-time world. We need uh, things that can communicate simultaneously in parallel. And we need them to be fast. And we need them to scale. And we need them to handle millions of requests. Uh, so uh, functions as they exist today, um, if you make an asynchronous call, you can't return a value because what if the API is not ready? Uh, you can't throw an exception if nobody's there to catch it. And so the way that we've sort of adopted before the world of promises uh, came into play is we used callback functions, and early versions of Node were totally focused around 
using callback functions to manage the asynchronous nature, because once you throw something onto the event loop, it's not up to you when it comes back. So, uh, so what happens is you start writing these callbacks, and these callbacks uh, respond to other nested callbacks, and other nested callbacks, and other nested callbacks. And eventually what you get is, I call it callback hell, the industry calls it callback hell, pyramid of doom, whatever you want. Um, so promises are here to save me from hell. And how do they do that? Well, the point of promises is to, is to give us back functional composition, error bubbling in the async world. So all the things that we get from synchronous functions, promises give us that capability to have those things in an asynch from asynchronous uh, functions. So they, we do this by saying that uh, your promise, your, sorry, your function returns a promise or an eventual result. Uh, and that promise can only do one of two things. It can be fulfilled or it can be rejected. And once either of those things happen, your promise will never change state. It will stay that way. So it's a very dependable way uh, to tell if your data's come back, if your image is loaded, if uh, your API is resolved. The, there will never be a question for the promise object as to what state anything's in. It either resolves or it rejects. So what do I mean by callback hell? Well, this is a, hopefully that's readable. Yeah, so this is a very primitive uh, example of what callback hell is. So the top one, uh, basically the inner function, once uh, it returns, outer function returns, outer function returns, and finally the outer function returns. So we, so depending on how complex, uh, think of a situation where you're loading data to a dashboard, um, where you're doing a data aggregator, you're doing a social media aggregator, uh, you want your you want a, a dependable way for your UI to render and not be waiting for things to come sporadically. So nesting with callbacks is a way to be sure that everything will return at once because you control when it returns. Uh, and then the the bottom shows basically the same primitive idea uh, with promises. And what happens is your callback hell disappears and because this is a straight line, we say that our uh, calls are flattened. Uh, the advantage of this is it's a lot easier to read. It's a lot easier to follow. Uh, six months from now, when you haven't touched a piece of code, and you come back and you see this versus that, it's going to be a lot easier for you to sort of remember where you left off. Because uh, we're not allowed to commit anything but comments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, like I said, we now have a behavior that was formerly reserved for synchronous logic. Uh, so we have a flattened callback structure. Uh, we can return values and we can throw in catch exceptions. Uh, for a promise to make the second and third work, uh, the asynchronous function itself, like I said, returns a promise object. Promise object has two methods, then and catch. And those methods will later be called depending on the state of the promise object, whether it's fulfilled or rejected. So the next question is, how do we take a synchronous function or, and convert it to an asynchronous Sorry, function? Sorry, did you just take, you took that straight out of the spec? Uh, this? Yeah. Is, uh, that, is that what's written in the RFC or? Uh, to, that verbatim is, is not from the spec. That's oh. more, so uh, like I, in the beginning, so I, when I thought, when I agreed to do a talk about promises, um, I had a few bookmarks that I yeah. knew I could depend on, but man, was it a rabbit hole right. when I started going down. Uh, so, um, and after this, I'll show you the one uh, document that I have that is a summary yeah. of the stream of thoughts, yeah. and it's huge. Uh, so, <laughs> no, uh, um, so I, this I, is more I, of a summary. Yeah, no, I, I, it's interesting. I'm not challenging. Oh, no, no, not at all. Um, it's, so actually, if I remember correctly, um, the spec simply said what makes something a promise is that it's venable. And right. the community frowned at that. They were yeah. like, no, it's so much more than that. So yeah. if you're just saying that, that's not enough information to yeah. give a developer to say, well, I want to use some, I want to use a promise because I need something venable. So, um, so I'm pretty sure this was not from the, right. the, right. the promise spec. Okay, uh, I'm going to jump back to that. So, 
this is what a promise looks like. Uh, it's very simple. So you assign a new promise object, and you pass in a callback function. And that callback function takes two parameters, resolve and reject. And in the body of that function, you can wrap them any way you want so that as long as they conform to the specification, which I'll show you in the next one for the fully populated uh, callback. Um, the, the purpose of this function is uh, to inform the promise object when the event which the promise represents has resolved or rejected. And that is it. That's all it serves. It doesn't serve any other purpose. If you try to pass other parameters to it, it doesn't follow spec and it will fail. Uh, so I actually misplaced this slide, so this should have went next. But now I'm going to go back just to here. So what is the major differences between callbacks and promises? Callbacks are functions, promises are objects. So callbacks are just a block of code which can run in response to events. Promises are objects which can store information whether or not those events have happened yet or not. So that's a very powerful thing. Callbacks are past arguments, promises are returned. So again, in the callback world, it's hard to return something because we don't know when it's going to come back. But promises have a guarantee that it's going to get something eventually, so it's safe to return to return from them. Uh, callbacks hinder success or failure. Promises don't actually handle anything. They are not concerned whether you've errored out or whether something has a success or a failure. They are strictly uh, lost my train of thought for a second. Um, so they are strictly responsible for executing what is in the body of the resolve or in the body of the, of the reject. So they don't care whether that's what you want or that's what you didn't want. Call, callbacks represent multiple events. Promises represent one event. And again, that's what makes it that's what makes it a lot easier to maintain your code. You're absolutely sure that only one thing has happened look at it, look at the promise. Okay, so um, again, using ES6 syntax, which you can use, again, in the ES5 world. Uh, so this is a promise. And so we're returning a new promise object. We're taking the callback, takes a resolve or reject uh, parameter. And this is where you would do your custom logic, but at the end of the day, you must either resolve or reject the promise. If you don't do this, it's not a promise. And again, this is a conceptual representation, so there's actually no logic in there. Now, what happens if you're using a library and you don't have access to write the, the functions themselves and those functions are synchronous and the patterns are they take all that? Uh, well, the great thing is, because you have control over where the resolve or reject happens, you can, you can wrap that original callback-based function inside a promise and deal with the resolve or reject normally where the success or error would happen. So to put this in a node context, uh, we are going to wrap the refile function from the file, uh, from the file system library. So we've declared our function, and we're going to take a file name in so that we can pass it through. This confused the hell out of me when somebody said, "What? how does a promise return a promise? I thought, what, how can a promise be returned? I promise to give you something, and you return it, and you say, no, you have a promise. <laughs> well, that didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> uh, but this is a representation of that. So um, you're actually, like to put it in context, you are returning a promise object, and you're populating the callback function yourself, taking in the resolve and reject. Uh, but as you remember originally, this would normally be the uh, success and fail, but we've just wrapped it with, instead of success or fail, we've got the reject or the resolve. So this would normally be where the content goes or whatever's coming back. Uh, but we've nested it in the resolve. So once you have this set up this way, 
Now your function can be then a file. So I can pass a file name in. Then, what do I want to do with it? I'm just going to console it out. Uh, but the great thing is, you don't just get a then method, you also get a catch method. And that catch method will handle your errors, uh, which makes it great, because you only have one place to check for your errors now. And you'll see um, when I uh, demonstrate chaining that uh, promises actually uh, delegate all the errors to one, can, can delegate all the errors uh, to one catch method. Again, it makes it really, really clean. You're not dealing with all these errors. It doesn't even matter if they're different APIs. They can all be handled in one place. So um, I wanted to give a uh, example of callback hell that uh, using Node that uh, we could relate to, and that would be uh, that would be relevant at this time of the year. Uh, so pretty much what I've decided to do is my three-year-old daughter wants a lot of stuff for Christmas, <laughs> and uh, she wants a lot of toys. She's actually had her mother give me a list of all the toys she wants. And there's 12 days of Christmas, and there happens to be 12 toys on the list. Now, I, as a 40-year-old, I now have brothers and sisters-in-laws. Uh, so back in the day, we would all just buy for each other, but our family is a hell of a lot bigger. So to buy for every single person would bankrupt me. Uh, <laughs> so we have adopted a secret Santa app called Elster. Uh, there's lots of them. Elster just happens to be the one my wife uh, liked. And we have populated it with all the things on our wish list. So I've decided to do a representation of what a display page for a child's secret Santa list would look like when it has to access multiple APIs. because. All the things she wants aren't available in one place. Some of them on Amazon, Toys R Us, Mastermind, Best Buy, you name it. So this won't even fit on a page. <laughs> now, this is a, actually, I'm going to go to Add Users. That's what I want to do. So um, I'm actually going to run this, so that's why I'm not actually making a request, because I didn't know what the internet would be. Uh, so I'm actually just reading uh, a bunch of JSON files locally from my file system uh, using the function that I made earlier that wraps the read file function in a promise. So first, uh, as you know with Node, we require the file system and we also require the promise object into polyfill it. You just add the uh, ES6 parameter and the dot promise property on the end and you will it will be polyfill. Uh, sorry, after you npm load the ES6 library. Okay. okay, so this is callback hell. And pretty much my little pony comes from Toys R Us. Once it returns, goes and grabs the N Nintendo product from Best Buy. Once it returns, goes to Mastermind, gets the Melissa and Doug piano. Once it returns, and so on and so forth. And so on and so forth. <laughs> so now, nobody in this room hopefully would ever write a function like this. This is just to prove a point. <laughs> I, I've actually, <laughs> when I'm in a hurry and, and I just have to get some data, uh, I've, you know, you, you, write, you write as fast as your stream of consciousness, so absolutely. Uh, so it's happened, and it's happened in Angular recently. <laughs> uh, okay, so once, so how do we solve this? Because this is a mess. So this is just what I showed earlier. This is the uh, read file function wrapped in a promise. I'm sorry? So much nicer. Yes, so much nicer. Um, and when we do that, we're just going to pop this. You see the difference. That will scale. That is readable. If anybody had to maintain that, they could. Now, the cool thing about this is I'm going to try and run this with one hand. The thing I want to point out down here is the council, the, the dime. So you can see my terminal? Yep. OK. So when I run this, what you're going to notice is the done happens before the promise returns. So it's reading my code synchronously, 
but the promise is going to resolve, it doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter when it resolves. It has returned a uh, eventual value. It has promised to give me something. So it's okay just sequentially moving on. Uh, let me make sure this is not wrapped. Okay, perfect. This actually that's next. This out the week. Perfect. So there's all the JSON. But if I go back up to the top, right, we'll see that done return first. So that's the advantages of promises. They will scale. They will not block your app. They will not tie you down. Other requests can come in. Millions of requests can come in. Now, when you look at this, yes, it's clean, but their promises actually, the promise object actually has another method that will make this even cleaner. So I'm just going to comment this out for a moment. So promise.all will actually take an array of promises, as many as you can throw at it. And like I said, if any of these error out, it's going to be handled here, one place. So again, if I run this, same thing. So as you can see, these two solutions are definitely a lot more maintainable. But in the second one, you wouldn't necessarily get my little pony before Nintendo every single time. That is correct. That is correct. Um, but it will make sure that they've all resolved right, before, before, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, before they all. The object is, if, uh, if you load this page, uh, you're not going to see one thumbnail, then another thumbnail five seconds later. They're all, you can add a spinner, you can animate it in, you can uh, you know, manage the UI a lot better because you can trust that everything will be shown at one time. I believe that's it. I believe there's opportunity for Q and A. Does anybody have any, any questions? I saw the uh, the done call earlier on. Um, is that part of a specific library? Or is that part of the spec? The done call is. I believe it's not part of the spec. I believe it's part of the the, the node spec for asynchronous. Uh, what is it? The, I think it's the HTTP. Okay. I believe so. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe a more experienced node dev knows that. So the question is, if uh, if there's one error, do they all not execute? Uh, the answer is, I believe it is uh, no. Uh, sorry, the answer is no. They do. If a promise can fulfill, it will fulfill. It's just the error object will have that, or sorry, the catch object will have the error for that specific promise that failed. So every promise can be either a success or a failed state. Uh, but if one fails, it's not going to take the rest down with it. So basically, you can change it like then, 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 like catch, and then, 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 catch. Yeah. If you fail at any of the first chain of events, go, go straight to the first catch. Catch all that and continue execution until the uh, next block. And the next block goes and the second catch. So if you wanted to get all the way through, you would do uh, then catch, then catch. Is that what you're saying? If you really want to catch every single pair, sure. every single pair. But if you yeah. don't care, um, then you have to catch at the other bar. Okay. Thank you. Yes, that is yeah. one thing. The catch method does not have to go at the bottom. And just like that, you can use it multiple times. Right. So now I'm used to seeing a finally as well, which would happen after either then or catch. Have you seen that in the spec, or is that something I'm imagining from one specific, or do you even know? I, 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 I like, saw the finally. I, I saw the finally too, and when I looked it up, I believe it was part of the Q library. Or that okay, was so it's not necessarily in the actual spec. There's a lot. Did. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. like there was denotify. That was one yeah. of them. Uh, there's a lot of utility around inspecting the 
partial yeah. resolve of promises, those yeah. libraries will give you the, more of a outside of the sort of outside of the okay, outside then. of the scope. Yeah. Yeah. Did your research take it all into it's basically the reactive programming libraries that are out there, like uh, JS or uh, not? Not to uh, not specifically uh, with regards to explaining the concept of promises, um, but I, I have definitely researched the, the reactive programming. Uh, it, I, I guess, it, the, this was more to uh, use the core promise spec and and to present it as a concept more than uh, relating to a specific library. Now, I do find, just like I said, AngularJS has their own subset of, like a lot of these SPA frameworks have subsets of libraries that they've adopted and attach their own error handling and methods to it so that you can expect a lot more. Some of them have wired them into their own debuggers. So there, there's, a, there's, it was a rabbit hole. There's a lot of different implementations of this, for sure. Jill? Um, my code occasionally throws errors. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's very nice to be able to catch them all at the end. Um, if you're catching them all at the end, how informative are the errors? Though? So how do you know which, where your error is coming from, what it is. So when you uh, when you wrap your functions and return a promise, you can actually you can still handle what the error will do specifically in the wrap, so you can console log out or add a debugger at the resolve state at that time, and it will tell you, like basically the whatever your your log fun, what your log return is for the promise that you've returned, that will show up. It's just you don't have to specifically tell the catch function to handle this, 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 or this. It automatically delegates them all to the one method. But yes, you can code your way around we're basically responsible for how much debugging we, we put in our code. So. But yes, you can. Can promises catch exceptions? Of yes. You have to look up this because I can't do it with an async or callback. It's in, like, to clarify that, it's like an exception that happened on the future ticks of the event. Like if you were to load a file successfully, for instance, and then you did a null reference, and then it would, would the, you know, with something like, so I did see an example of that, and uh, some of the libraries actually had a their own implementation of the next tick function, and you could actually pass, uh, you could handle if the if the error was uh, is, if the error was not uh, if you were not able to catch it in the catch, then the next tick would pass it to the catch, like it would be responsible. So maybe it would error out. Uh, a couple of milliseconds later than it should have, but uh, the core library doesn't. But uh, some of the, like Q specifically and Bluebird, have a next have a, a next method that will that will handle that. Yeah. 